Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours. I'm your host Simon, and with this show, I want to ask 1,000 lawyers over the 2020s the second question that everybody asks everybody: What do you do? Please like, share, and subscribe to the show. If you're a lawyer, then be my guest on the show. What do you do? Tell me about it. Go to western-studios.com/b hyphen on hyphen a hyphen podcast or email working hours pod at western hyphen studios.com you can follow the show on twitter at western studios 2 and on instagram at western underscore studios underscore leads you can support the show with a one-off donation on ko-fi so that's ko-fi.com ko-fi dot com slash working hours or to offer more regular support you can subscribe to this show for as little as a pound a month on patreon that's patreon.com forward slash working hours pod this is episode nine of the working hours podcast again i'll keep the intro short here we're going to get straight into the interview this is the first interview with a lawyer working outside of leeds so again it's an anonymous episode and this is someone from leeds working somewhere else in this case london so i hope you enjoy this interview i will be back at the end briefly and that's it from me for now what did you want to be when you grew up well because i'm a really exciting person i wanted to be um, an accountant because i really liked the calculators that printed shop receipts out and and i remember remember, (laughs) i remember thinking that the most exciting thing in the world would be be able to like play with one of those calculators on a daily basis and i thought that's what accountants did so i decided that that's what i was going to do um but it didn't it didn't pan out for me in that way and i'm quite glad actually in much respect <laughs> so uh, i mean you must have been quite young when you were thinking that so when were you disavowed of that notion when they stopped making those calculators or well i mean to be honest my first desire was to be a hollywood film star but that also it, i mean i think i realized early on that might not happen so then it went on to the accountancy and then i think i thought about you know journalism because I thought you know I have a lot to say I think I can say it really well I'll be a journalist but then I didn't quite get my um work experience in order to make that happen and then I did that thing where I was just like oh god what will I do maybe it's not too late to do a law conversion (laughs) (laughs) which suggests that you'd already studied so what were you studying originally I actually did um sorry um, I actually did a American studies degree um, okay. because I I didn't want to do something. I thought if I did English, straight English, I would have to do Chaucer, and I just didn't fancy Chaucer. So um, I decided to do an interdisciplinary degree. So I did history, um, English, and Spanish, but in the guise of American studies at Edinburgh. Um, and then I did um, a master's in American literature and culture. Okay. Uh, so did that involve travel stateside as well then? Yeah, so I did a year in um, Tempe, Arizona at ASU when I was uh, 20. So a bit too young to drink, unfortunately, unless you went into the biker bars with your fake Isaac card. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> fun nonetheless. Cool. So I suppose at that point you were still thinking about journalism. Uh, No, I think I, yeah, no, potentially, yes. I I mean, I just had no idea what I wanted to do because I think it's really tough. And I think I was really impressed that people had made decisions to sort of study maths and science to do medicine because I was still drinking cider (laughs) 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 and thinking, well, I'm just a kid. It doesn't matter. I don't have to make any decisions. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've always been a bit of a like. It, it, I don't. I'm not very good at making decisions when it affects me um, on a personal level. So you weren't. You weren't inclined for other to people. sort of. Well, that's always easier, isn't it? <laughs> you weren't inclined to sort of just follow in your parents' footsteps or any family members. Well, actually, because that put me off teaching. I think my mum and dad are both teachers, and my sister's an English teacher, and I even though. We had great holidays when we were younger because we could just 
disappear to France for a month without really thinking about it. Um, I saw how much they worked in terms of, you know, the marking and everything like that. I saw a lot of the downside of of teaching. And so that was something that just actually just put me off that as a career. Um, What what about sort of careers advice at school? Oh, well, I got um, certain where I enjoyed math six form years um I did one of those you know you do a questionnaire and you get an assessment of what you should be like what you should look into as a career and yeah. I got um they told me that I should probably work in a theme park on the right <laughs> <laughs> and I thought hmm, I'm not sure I want to do that forever um and, you know we only had like water valley nearby so I wasn't convinced that whatever that system was really worked yeah no, it is largely terrible. I don't know what it's like now. So what are you doing now then? What do you do these days? So I mentioned the, the law conversion earlier. So when I was about 25, I decided that I was going to go back to study law. So I did a I did a graduate diploma in law um, and then an LPC. And so now I work for a travel company as one of their in-house lawyers, mm-hmm. which is Weirdly, like I quite enjoy my job in some respects. I haven't been, um, I haven't been the most effective in lockdown, let's say, but I don't think that, um, a lot of people have. Uh, yeah. So it's really, it's sort of inconsistent. Like it's been crazy, crazy busy while we've been sorting a lot of things out because obviously it's not the best time to work in a travel company. So we've had to make some decisions in terms of furlough. Um, and so that was a really crazy busy time for me. And then I think I sort of took my foot off the pedal about, for a week after because I was really tired <laughs> yeah. responding to emails at 4am and that kind of thing but it's really interesting I've got no clue at all if I'll still have a job in a few months but I'm going with it for now but I've worked in quite a few different companies in-house and I've also worked in a law firm but I decided for me it I didn't want to do sort of one specific area of law I thought it was more it's a bit like my degree again you know I don't like to be pigeonholed into doing English and Chaucer and um, <laughs> I like to just you know and it, there is a fair amount of winging it going on because when you aren't specialized in a in an area and you have to deal with a variety of different things all the time then you know there's there's quite a bit of like well I don't know the answer to that but I'll find out so yeah. but I mean it makes it keeps things sort of interesting I think I like the variety yeah so you're doing you know you're getting you're not doing the same thing all the time you're getting something different every every now and again and... yeah I mean you just don't know what's going to come up and it, it's and it's hilarious as well I think when you're an in-house lawyer the amount of questions that you get that are absolutely nothing to do with the law yeah. it's quite funny <laughs> it's like I've got a problem and it's like, well that's weird that you're asking me about it <laughs> and I've got a actually quite a funny a recent one was um this guy was like I wonder if you can help me with something and I was like okay sure yeah what is it and he's like well my parents have adopted a dog and the person that they adopted it from now wants to reclaim the dog what's the position I just thought well I've got no idea why are you asking <laughs> <laughs> this is really weird I suggest you google it because that's what I would do mm. <laughs> but you know I was trying to be helpful so I was like well it I did obviously look it up because I'd, <laughs> I'm too polite not to <laughs> I said, well it's not really clear the courts have gone either way <laughs> who knows what will happen <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your budget for this for this case <laughs> I'll tell you your likelihood of winning <laughs> Oh dear, and I actually haven't had an update on the on the dog, so I have no idea what's happened. Did you see any pictures? Sound of the dog. Bit of a nightmare position. No, no, no oh. pictures of that particular dog, but I did get some pictures of his other dog. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, that was the nice. Word, the word dog pictures involved. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you did your law conversion, so like going into the legal end of things, how long did that take? turn around so sort of like you've already done study you're doing additional study so you've got a few years of that and then after that you've got to get sort of practice essentially so how long did that process take so the 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 diploma was sort of just like an academic year 
So they just try and do all your core subjects really quickly. So obviously it's not as in-depth as the law degree that you can do over three or four years. But you do all your basic subjects and you've got to do, you know, whatever's required. So it's quite an intense year and it's not it's not the kind of university study where you might have, a, you know, let's say 12 contact hours a week and you don't yeah. really do very much else. It was quite intense. We were in every day sort of nine to five apart from like a Wednesday afternoon so it was quite full on and then so you do your conversion and then you have to do your legal practice course which is a more sort of practical application of what you've learned the year before and so that was another academic year and I think it was slightly less contact hours but still quite intense and then once you're I mean that's if you want to be a solicitor obviously if you want to be um, a barrister you do the, the BBC and I don't actually know if it even called that anymore but whatever the equivalent is now so I did the legal practice course. That's the bar exam isn't it? Yeah yeah Yeah. exactly. I did the legal practice course and then you're not technically qualified until you've done two years training be that in a firm or in in a business so after that I had to do the two years of um, being a trainee sister before I actually qualified so it's it's quite a long process I guess if you've already then studied for five years before which is what I did. Do you think do you think the study beforehand helped or hindered? Do you think that sort of gave you sort of more skills going in, into the study and Yeah, I think for me, um I wouldn't have considered doing, you know, a law degree first off in the same way that I didn't want to do English, not because mm-hmm. of Chaucer, but in terms of uh, you know, I feel like it's a bit too narrow. So I think it was good for me and I think it was good to to come at it, as, you know, a bit older, even though obviously I was 25, so I was hardly old. But, yeah. you know, just that few years makes a difference. Well, there still did that thing where I was like, I'm going to work so hard. I'm going to get all these top marks. And, and actually, of course, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> so then like actually finding the placements, was that quite easy? Because law's law's quite a competitive field, isn't it? Well, it wasn't easy at all, no. Um, so in the run-up to sort of when we were finishing all of our courses, I remember people saying it was all around the global financial crisis, the last one that we thought was really bad before the one that's coming. So it wasn't a great time to qualify at all. But, you know, people would say, oh, training contracts, they're like gold dust. So it's quite difficult. But I ended up weirdly so I did English law but I'd lived previously as I said in Edinburgh and I ended up getting a training contract at a Scottish firm but doing English law mm-hmm. and actually Scots law is quite different in in yeah. certain areas like you know employment well and employment is actually very similar but in terms of process but you know property law and will I and trust I think and... can be quite yeah quite different and um, but I was I joined a, a company and we, I was basically doing sort of commercial property, but mainly acting for banks. When you're training under English law, and this doesn't apply to Scotland, you've got to do at least three separate distinct areas in your training contract, one of which has to be contentious. I did this commercial property seat that was basically for a year, and then I did employment litigation, employment and corporate. So I got a fair bit of different sort of experience and I thought I'd really like employment but I didn't massively enjoy that part of it because I think it was almost the firm that I worked for had a big insurance client so we used to get real sort of time wasted cases you know just people who didn't want to go to work so they were trying to sue everyone right and I had no patience for me at all. Like, oh. <laughs> it didn't leave you inclined to sort of defend them and fight for their you know legal you know, rights I just thought stop being so lazy and just go to work you know and obviously there are genuine cases where people have issues and they should be suing their employers but we just got a lot of time wasters who had it you know they were covered by this insurer so they were just trying it on yeah um, and I was just not I wasn't impressed by it do you, do you think a lot of those a lot of those people are, are literally you know they think they're going to get a big payout so they're going for you know, because you see a lot of like injury lawyers and so on, mm. right? People who just are, are just doing sort of cash cash transaction essentially in the courts, where they're like, "Oh, this this could get us some cash, and we can give that to the client. We can get some money." Do you think there's some of that? Because there is, 
I think a lot of people view law sometimes as like another consumer product of like something you go, you go and buy it and then you get a, you know you get a result which would be a payout or a win um do you think that's fair yeah I think I guess so but I think what in those kinds of cases like you'll hear occasionally of some people who get a big payout for example in an employment or personal injury case and I, actually most of the time it's um not like that at all so you know if you've got a dispute with your employer it's really unlikely that you'd ever go to tribunal because in in fact you would normally settle at an earlier stage or and for not very much money but you just you know it's it's quite expensive yeah to take things further and you know if you think about what a partner might charge in terms of an hourly rate and it mm. you know I mean, in London, it's a huge amount, but let's say 300 quid, somebody to look at something for an hour, you're already losing money. And so I think, in fact, that it's very rare that you would get a big payout from an employment case, although obviously not unheard of because of Mm. the reported cases. But I think people assume that going to tribunal is a good idea and it's, you know, more often than not, absolutely not a good idea. Yeah, it's hassle and it's a nightmare. Um, I want to go yeah, back a bit. Probably, just... sorry, I was just going to yeah. say also probably like not a nice experience. No. Because it's quite stressful, yeah. I imagine. Sorry, going back. But, well, I would imagine as well, a, a lot of people are already in a position where they're, you know, to be taking your employer to court, you've got to be quite angry with them in the first place and vice versa, I suppose. Um, yeah. So you've already got the animosity there before you get into the court. So, yeah, I suppose there's a lot of bad feeling with that. And these things tend to drag on as well, don't they? So it's just sort of prolonging the agony. Yes, absolutely. And I think in terms of if you have got an issue like that, it's sometimes just best to sort of cut your losses and move on. Um, And and you can come to a, a settlement, you know, without going to tribunal. And that's probably the best thing to do if you can, or at least try it. What is the gender balance in, in law these days? Is it quite mixed? or? Yeah, I think historically it wasn't, but I think it is quite mixed now. And you see a lot of a lot of GTs, for example, that are female, a lot of people in quite senior positions within companies that are female. So, yeah, I think it, it's probably pretty even, although I've got no idea what it actually is. If you, There's probably figures on it that you could Google quite easily, but... I think it's much, much more balanced than it was probably 20 years ago, for example. So, yeah, I wanted to go back a bit just to the the lockdown and you're saying, you know, sort of answering emails at 4 a.m. So when you went into lockdown, was it just a sort of, well, I'm working from home and so I'm going to get everything done and then you just didn't know where to kind of draw the line and have time to yourself or was it, well, no, was it lack it was of just... things? Do or was it like you needed to feel busy or no it was just because there was so much to do so I work for a company it's actually based in Asia the headquarters are in Asia and I look after the Europe offices and the US so we had to look at the different government schemes for various countries throughout Europe and the US um, and obviously with the US it varies state to state so we've got a few different offices over there so there was literally just quite a lot of information to gather and mm. comprehend and work out, you know, what what can we do to cut some costs but, you know, minimise any job losses yeah. um, by taking advantage of the different schemes. So it was really just trying to get all of it done. And it wasn't like I wasn't working till four o'clock all, all the time. It was just a, a very intense couple of weeks while we tried to sort all of that. Yeah, and I suppose with the different time zones as well, you've got to be available. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I'm getting questions from Asia early in the morning and I'm getting questions from the US later on in the evening. So it's just, but it's not, um, I mean, people in in the company that I work for at the moment generally just pull away and are happy to do it. And there are various benefits. Are like pretty, they're pretty nice and they've tried to, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's a travel company and nobody's going anywhere. It's not a good time. So they're trying to work out how to rejig everything. Obviously, now Asia's opening up a little bit more again in certain parts, you know, like China. Um, it's more about trying to angle the domestic markets instead of international because we're all in this strange situation and 
can't get on planes. Yeah. Or even if you can, there's a lot of people who don't want to now. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's going to take a long time um, to return to any semblance of normality. And, you know, that's the reality of it. So we have to see what we can do um, as a business in terms of changing what we're doing Mm. to survive, I guess. And we're in a pretty good position as a business. It's just, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. And I've had quite a lot of my friends, for example, have been furloughed or have um, lost the jobs because businesses aren't surviving. And that's just a reality of life at the moment. And I think you've got to be sort of quite pragmatic about it in a way. But it's still hard. It's still like, it's not nice feeling sort of anxious about whether or not you'll have a job in a few months and but yeah you know at the same time there's this weird global pandemic thing going on you've got to be grateful that your family are healthy or whatever so you know it's just a very strange time somebody I didn't know um I hadn't heard this before but my friend I was trying to explain you know like you're fine one minute you're just dealing with it and and then the next day, you just feel this awful doom. And it's, and my friend was like, yes, the Corona Coaster. <laughs> like, I had not heard that. The Corona <laughs> what? My favorite. The Corona Coaster. You know, like the roller coaster that is Corona. Ah, corona right. Yeah, yeah. Corona it's Coaster. Like, yes, exactly. The highs and the lows, of course. <laughs> well, I think, um, I, I think that's a good point. It was quite interesting as we went through the process. And I, I, I said to myself that I was going to sort of like, you know, journal it or document it, but um, you know, didn't. Uh, but you, you know, you would hear people saying things, and it's like everyone kind of went through the same thought processes. Is right, like, you know, like initially I was in the denial of like that's a load of rubbish. It's just a load of like media nonsense that's coming to us, and I didn't want to deal with any of it. And I'm like, this is distracting from more important issues. Why are we getting all excited about this? And then, like, actually sat down and read some stuff about it, and it was like, oh, God, it's like a thing that we have to deal with. We'll do this. And then, um, you know, for, for me as well, because I've been, you know, largely at home in my room for long periods of time over the last few years. It's like, well, that's not much different to me. But it's like, even if you're a person who's indoors all the time, all the, time the fact that you can't go out now is kind mm. of like, well, I want to go out, you know, you, and, and just seeing all the traffic disappear and the animals coming back and it's like, this is weird. So, you know, like, you, you get definitely a roller coaster of sort of like, you're up, you're positive about it, like there'll be good outcomes for it. And then you're like, oh, this is negative. It's never going to end. And then you like, you get paranoid and then you get annoyed at someone. And um, yeah, and then the, the thing is as well, you know, lots of people, we're saying sort of the return to normality and I think now people are realizing that that the reality is that there is not a return to normality it's like a new phase of something else so like you were saying a lot of people um you know even people that have been furloughed their workplaces are now going actually I'm not sure we can afford you now um Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's well, yeah cool. I mean, obviously, furlough is an alternative to redundancy, essentially. So, you, you, if I was furloughed at the moment, I'd be quite worried about the fact that I probably wouldn't be going back to work. Um, but that's, you know, but some companies are just doing it because it's it makes sense to do it. It's an effective cost cutting measure, and it gives them more runway. And I and I think, you know, while the government's providing it, obviously that is massively going to change after um july but uh why not why not take advantage of things like that if they can save people's jobs or give them a bit of time where some money's coming in and i know various companies have have decided to you know actually just pay sort of 80 percent of an actual salary rather than it being subject to that 2500 maximum that you know the government have offered um which I think is also good because people have, at the end of the day have mortgages to pay or rent to pay um, and kids to feed and, you know, commitments that they've, you know, signed up for without knowing that this would all happen and the world was going to turn absolutely crazy. And who knew that contagion 
in 2011 would actually come true. <laughs> I had no idea, but I did recently watch that and could not believe that that it was a film that was then became real life. Mm. Yeah, well, and it's going to happen more often as well because you had, you know, you've had the Sards, you've had Mers, you've had all these other ones in Asia have kind of been through a few of these before, so they're a bit more, well, even with like Zika and Ebola and um, mm. so they're, they're going to happen more often and kind of more regularly and a lot of places have been, you know, like they've done the, the emergency planning for this stuff, but then they're just like, well, we're not going to spend on that, that's not going to happen. And then <laughs> it's like it happens and like, ah. Oh. Um, Oops. Well, I mean, I yeah. think, you know, I, I'm just really pleased that even though we've never experienced anything like this um, really for a, you know, such a long time uh, in the UK that our government acted, you know, in the best interests of the people at all times and continue to do so. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's uh, basically, I mean, they always have and they always will. Uh, so I'm really pleased about that uh, and <laughs> yeah I mean it's really quite frustrating that we literally saw it happen everywhere else and could have learned quite a few lessons um, but you know instead we didn't do that and now you know people all around the world are just laughing at the UK and their inability to handle anything and I mean I don't know if you saw that shit show yesterday it was Dominic Cummings <laughs> explaining no, why not. his actions were fine. Um, brilliant and amazing because he's brilliant. Yeah. Amazing. You know, he would have done the same thing again and uh, it's completely fine. Well, but... he did. He did do the same thing again. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think, he's you right know, there. while the opticians are closed, if you need an eye test, go for a drive. I just. <laughs> I, d- I just don't understand. Anyway, yeah, I mean, meanwhile, it is. I spent a week in the dark with toothache. Um, exactly. You know, you yeah, like massive abscess that you probably needed to be hospitalised for. But God forbid you go outside unnecessarily, Simon. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely been... Um, well, it, like you say, it's not over yet. I mean largely a lot of the people aren't going to be going back to work but also the realization that you know your your spend is someone else's income and a lot of people don't think of that as just like you know there's this whether it's an assumption in people or it's just you know like common wisdom but just that the customers are always there and the money's always there and but it is ultimately about confidence like people have the trust and the confidence to spend and that you know because a lot of people will have been burnt especially in the travel industry like I know people who have booked holidays and then they can't get that cash back because that business has gone under or like you know the business can't afford to pay them back or lots of varieties of that so that then affects trusts of like well there's no point me spending this much money on a holiday if it's not going to be there like I can't plan that far in ahead because so when I worked for, like when I've worked in travel, you would get people who were booking sort of a year, two years in advance because they were like, you know, they have to save up for it if it's a big trip and that kind of thing. Mm. So you'll a lot of that kind of custom will go because people will be a bit more cautious about having that trust that everything will be there in two years. I think so. It's gonna it's gonna take yeah. a while to build that that confidence back. In terms of the working from home, has that been quite easy? Has that given you sort of more flexibility? Well, yeah, I think it gives you, you get time back in your day that you would have always spend, you know, on a train. Yeah. Um, so I live in South East London and was commuting to uh, near Paddington. So it, it probably should take about 45 minutes, but if it's rush hour, it maybe it takes an hour sometimes or... Um, so there's a couple of hours in the day that you sort of get back. So um, I'm getting up around the same time as I would usually, but instead of just getting in the shower and heading off to work, I'm going out for a run or um, trying to do some exercise. Uh, so it makes things like that a lot easier. And obviously, um, no, that's very, it's, it's nice to be able to do that. I feel like it sort of sets you up for the day. 
Mm. It gives you sort of some routine that might otherwise not be there. I think that's something that I had to get into the habit of some routine um, mm. just to frame my day. Because I think otherwise, how do you, you know, you didn't, I wasn't expecting, I actually just moved um, the week before lockdown. <laughs> they moved house. Um, but I still don't have broadband because they just failed to turn up. So I've got like, I had to get a, a mobile sort of broadband solution thing that we've both been trying to make work. And um, it's, we're doing all right, we're doing all right. But, it, you know, things like that, having their broadband when you're working from home is quite yeah. a challenge. A challenge. Um, <laughs> mm, uh, but yeah, for me, what I was just saying about routine, I think it it's quite difficult to separate your non-working life from your working life when actually mm. you just spend all of the time in the same area um yeah. so i think that that i was like right if i go for a run and then you actually start your working day and i'm quite strict about those timings so um you know i need to be sort of sitting down at my desk which is the dining room table and where i'm sitting now um for like nine half nine um and and me you know I'm quite often I've got I'm supposed to be on calls earlier than that or whatever but you know I'm not one of these people that's like oh you know I'll stay in bed till 10 and then yeah. I just wouldn't do anything I have to be quite strict about starting my day and being fully dressed I've seen some of those zoom call fails where you know people don't realize they're on a video and it, they stand up and they're completely naked I mean that has not been my lockdown experience at all I've been you know I've got dressed <laughs> um I've done I've done some exercise <laughs> but I, I do think I have to have a bit of a it has to be routine otherwise I'd be useless finding how to get into your own routine or making yourself get into a routine I think is quite difficult um I mean it depends who you are so like some people find it easier than others but I think it is an adjustment even for people who are quite regimented like all of a sudden your workplace has moved that is quite discombobulating I think yeah no I think that's you know I think that's right and I'm not one of those people that's really regimented but I feel like I have to force some semblance of regiment upon myself to just yeah. in order to just get through my work do you manage to actually get sort of foot breaks in for yourself or do you just generally work through and sort of you know eat at your desk and yeah, do the work as you yeah I try and like I think especially when it comes to eating like obviously I look forward to my meals really mm. disproportionately because that's the only thing that happens in my day is like I can have a meal <laughs> you know like so um and I've been trying to like um trying to eat healthily because I think um that I think because I'm you know probably drinking quite a lot more on a weekend than I usually would um just in order to deal with the COVID doom um, I'm trying to sort of balance it out in terms of the food that I'm putting into my body. So I have no idea what shape my liver's in. Um, mm. But, you know, I'm trying to be, eat healthy just to mitigate the damage. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm putting quite a lot of thought into those meals. So I, and I think it's important to not just eat while you're trying to do something else that you need to focus on and enjoy what yeah. you're eating. Um, so no, I, I do... I'll, you know I'll take 20 minutes and I'll have some lunch or um you know and then I think we try and like totally remove all of the workstation things when we have our evening meal and we set the table yeah um, so we you know we're, we're sort of there's quite a lot of pomp and ceremony that goes into our meal arranging mm. um and I think that's quite important when that's really all that you've got going on in the day unless it happens to be one of those days when you need to take a trip to the supermarket for example which is also another treat in these lockdown times <laughs> or not actually in London because people don't know how to socially distance <laughs> but <laughs> I'm finding some of the rules slightly odd um, I think I'd like to give them like to, to be fair I think it is a difficult thing to kind of uh you can't you can't necessarily universalize these things. It's it's like, all right, well, even if you go into lockdown, it's like, well, everyone goes to lockdown. What about the people that have to actually do stuff and work? Okay, not them. 
<laughs> to everyone else. But that, do, do you know what I mean? There's always something left out. You, you can't kind of do these blanket rules. And, and I think as well, it just, you know, it really demonstrates again how disconnected people in power are from, from reality. Of just like, oh, well, everyone can work from home. And before it was like, well, why you shouldn't be working from home. There's no need to work from home. A lot of businesses think in that way. And then now they're like, well, they can work from home. Why don't they just work from home? And <laughs> well, you know, Twitter said we can now that, work. yeah, well, Twitter, have a, uh, quite a few companies have just said that they'll forever allow people to work from home on a permanent basis. Mm. Um, and I think in my company, for example, I think certainly in um, some departments, there was quite a reluctance to let people work from home. Um, which is quite odd for a travel company type tacky company because that's the whole thing everybody's like yeah we're so flex man do what you want as long as you get your work done um, but now obviously we've been forced into a situation where we're working from home and, and even before lockdown um, I, I had been working from home for a couple of weeks because we had you know, suspected cases of COVID in the building and things like that. So we all got sent home. Um, and that, um, yeah, so we were sort of working a couple of weeks before, or maybe three weeks before um, from home anyway. So, and now it's started to become sort of more normal. Um, but one thing I think is quite important, and I think there might be a bit of fallout from this is, Actually, are we are we set up to work from home in a healthy way? You know, you, if you go into an office, people from a health and safety point of view will be like, you'll have to have your workplace assessment and make sure yeah. that your arms are at a right angle and all of this. And you well, know, even just make, even just wires do. around the house, like you know, your your cables for your laptops yeah. and stuff. Like in a workplace, they're going to be out of the way. At home, you're going to be like, eh. you know, you're easy trip and do yourself an injury or break the wall or break the work computer but, you so, know there's a lot of people who um are the only place that they can have a call for work because of whatever the living arrangements are would be in the bedroom on the bed it's not like everybody's got a study lying about that they can just go in and use it's perfectly set up yeah you're sitting in for eight hours a day or whatever your daily you know your work day looks like so there's lots of things, I mean, like that. I bought a ridiculous, I don't even know where it is, like a cushion, a wobble cushion thing that's supposed to make you sit up a bit straighter. Yeah, I yeah. realised I'm sitting my whole life, like, yeah, you know, yeah. a bit hunched. So, and that's actually made quite a bit of a difference. But I think you'll, there's going to be loads of people who need physio because they're not sitting in the right you know, yeah, they're sit, the right sitting way. on their sofa or something like that, and then they're just yeah. hunched over the whole time working on a laptop, and that's yeah. you know it's not set up properly. And you, it's harder to do DSE assessments when you're in the home. So. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of, I mean, I, I was on some sort of webinar thing the other day, and this was coming up quite a lot. But there is the even though people are working from home, the the employers still have that responsibility to make sure that employees are working in a safe environment so how how then do you go about that I mean especially in a situation where you're not really supposed to get you know you can't send people around to each other's houses and check what they're doing or mm. you know it's just like a total minefield mm. and I don't know how that will work out um and I, my boss said to me um last week so because quite a lot of the people in the UK are currently on furlough for the time being there's only sort of five of us that would be in the office so he was saying well actually you could you you guys could go into the office and work from there just because of the numbers and it, and he wasn't trying to encourage it or anything like that he was just sort of saying you know it's it's a possibility and I was like yeah that that's true and I, I don't think I'd be worried about being in the office I said but I don't want to get on the train here yeah. where you know and that's really the only feasible way I can get into work and um, it's too far to walk and um, I'm not really a massive fan of bikes or being killed on a bike in London which I feel is what would happen so you know I said I don't you know it, they're saying that they're running at whatever capacity but they're actually not and they're not letting anybody on them or they say they're not letting as many people on them but from the pictures that I've seen it looks like they're letting quite a few people on yeah but you can always um, position an angle to make it look like there's more people in the room can't you <laughs> 
So, yeah, yeah so I just I don't think a lot of people would be comfortable with the travelling in and travelling out. And actually, if you have, if you are scared that that journey would put you in some sort of danger, which realistically it absolutely could, then you, you shouldn't have to go into work. And I mean, that, there's obviously legislation that, that says that as well. So, yeah, I think we're not going to be going back to the office for a really long time. And so I think I, um, even when we do, when people come back from furlough, you know, we've moved to, a, well, we haven't moved yet, but we will be moving to a slightly smaller office um, just because the, you know, the office that we had pre-lockdown was one that was taking into account all of the projected growth you know from last you know last year's figures pre-pandemic so um we're going to go into a much smaller office and yeah. we'll have you will probably have to go on some sort of rotor system where half the office come in one day and the next day the other half you know it'll be yeah. who knows what it'll look like yeah so if if you had to like if, if this was the change and you were working from home could you do this job like could you continue on in this role or would you feel the need to look for something else or something different or to sort of have another career change? Um, like, would you be quite comfortable working this way going forward, like for the foreseeable future? I mean, obviously in the short term, it's like, well, this is what we have to do. But, you, you know, in the back of your mind, you're always kind of, yeah, but then I'll go back into work and then we'll be doing the same old, same old. Yeah, I think I'm quite lucky in that it's a, a job that I can do from anywhere and I can do from home and I mean I'm not saying it's ideal all the time but it's something that's it's quite easy for me to be able to do it from home and a bar sort of I think sometimes it's good to have in-person meetings rather than on a video call for example and you know in terms of building relationships with people in the business it's easier in person but you know equally I'm I've always worked in places where I'm dealing with people in different countries or I'm in a different country. So this has always been a part of my day-to-day reality mm. anyway. And like I said, there's a lot of people who are in much, much, much worse positions than, than I am. And I think it, it would be fair, it would be easy for me to work from wherever. Mm. I have well, to I think suppose, about it. Well, I think a lot as well, you know, like you say, it is easier with face-to-face meetings and in a role like that you are going to be meeting a lot of people I would imagine like Mm -hmm. whether it's new people who are asking questions or you're going asking questions elsewhere or you're in a meeting or like so you'll have quite a lot of collegiate interaction through the day Uh, and obviously you can get that to a degree through video chats and so on but it's it's not the same and the video chats can be quite exhausting in the way that meeting a person face-to-face isn't um Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know where I'm going in terms of like formulating the question for this, but um, is, is that harder or easier or is it a bit of both or it's just like, is it, does it make the, okay, here's the question, I suppose. Like <laughs> meeting a person face to face is much easier and more enjoyable, I would guess, than, than having to do this and sort of start from scratch on uh, video chat. Or, or would you say it's about the same now? I think people are getting more used to this, but I still, I don't think that makes it easier to like connect with somebody. For example, if you just, if I just started my job now, and I met people, I hadn't met people face to face, and actually, I mean, I've never met my boss, for example, because um, he's based in Asia. And um, I was supposed to go over towards the end of February and that was cancelled, obviously, because uh, the situation was quite different in Asia at that stage where it hadn't really happened yet properly in the UK. So, um, and he said to me last week, I I feel like you're my friend who I've never met. (laughs) (laughs) But we get on fine and I've never met him. Um, yeah. But I think it's it's still hard. It's it's much easier when you have met people, so yeah, you know you get a bit more of a feel for what they're like, and you're more likely to have um, you know, a bit of banter 
mm. I guess, if you've met somebody in real life. Um, so I think it's, I think people are, are getting used to it and I think people can continue to do it and it obviously all of this virtual <laughs> stuff makes that a lot easier but it's still it's still not the same mm. but is it is sense. it more is it more efficient I mean I've had people say to me that sort of you know having your meetings online does get rid of some of the kind of you know the meeting room politics yeah, of, like the personal stuff people talk more about what what they need to talk about for the meeting yeah I think that you know there's obviously an argument to say that that's absolutely true but I mean there's a lot of everything's more efficient you know we're not using transport as much we're not you know everyone's been a bit well I, certainly the people that I know of getting into that whole doing the exercise because they've got the opportunity to do it and um, so I think a lot of things are probably more efficient but yeah, I don't know it's quite nice to have those you know pointless chats about rubbish that mm. you know it's nice to chat people are talking crap don't they mm. well, I certainly do small talk yeah that's right yeah. Um, no, I don't mean like how's your weekend da, 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 da. but you know it's just that's how you get to know people isn't it yeah and just bits okay. of gossip and, and then other bits of information sometimes work related sometimes not sometimes they'll come in useful well, you know like who's who's having an affair with whoever else or yeah. you know that kind of thing that's the kind of thing I like to hear about the, the hot gossip spill the tea um so I'll keep it on fun topic. So I want to touch on Brexit. Um, so... Oh, my favourite. <laughs> uh, so is that going to have an effect on you? Or do you know if it will have an effect on you? Or is it, again, something that is as clear as mud? I think we don't really know anything. And this pandemic's just made that a situation that will be, that we're not going to know anything for a long time. I think a lot of things to do with Brexit I mean personally for me it's making me become Irish so that is having quite a big effect on me because previously I wasn't Irish but I will be soon uh, so you know Brexit I, I felt really strongly about Brexit and I had no idea it was going to happen and I think you know sometimes I forget about it because of the global pandemic but when I'm reminded of it I feel sad inside <laughs> okay well I'm glad to give you that feeling <laughs> 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 so yeah again it, it, it's something that yeah it, it's hard to say until it actually happens um so let's talk about something else so um in terms of other firms that you've worked for uh what have been what have been the most interesting parts of the job that you've been involved in what what are some of the frustrations so uh, for me, um, so I've worked in a, now a couple of companies that um, are quite uh, sort of have, have high growth rates. So like I've been there towards the beginning of the legal function being there, for example. And so we've had to put lots of, it was always just quite a lot of firefighting, but it's interesting. There's quite a lot of stuff that, um, I mean, one of my old jobs, I ended up also doing like quite a lot of public affairs stuff. So I was lobbying in Brussels quite a lot, which is something that I'd never, obviously I wouldn't have thought that that's what I would, would be doing. But um, that was really interesting, like meeting, you know, MEPs and people from the commission and um, seeing how it you know how it all operates and how bureaucratic it is and you know there's so many stages that you've got to get through it's like yes but that's got now it's with the dg comp and it'll be there for some time and actually you've got to wait because so and so the commissioners but it feels very you know what blah blah it's like okay it's going to take five years fine whatever um but you know that was something that i didn't think i'd ever have the opportunity to do and it was really interesting so there's lots of things that I've been really lucky to be able to be involved in 
and you know I did I spent a year in Singapore with um one of my old jobs as well uh sorry. which sorry I got I got someone called me then so I got uh, um we'll have to go back a bit to Brussels okay when uh I don't know I was, I've kind of interrupted what you were saying so I'll have to I'll have to work around that no, no. okay um yeah so what what were you saying before I rudely interrupt I was just saying that I there was lots of things that I have had an opportunity to do because of my jobs that I wouldn't have necessarily thought that I would have done so I thought that you know the time that I spent in Brussels that was really interesting um and I was able to I lived in Singapore for a year for example with one of my other jobs and I, I really liked Singapore. I'm not sure I'd want to live there forever because it can be quite a strange place, but it was totally easy Asia. And, mm. you know, who speaks English, it's a really good hub for traveling elsewhere. You know, you can just pop off or you, you used to be able to just pop off <laughs> for the weekend, you know, go to Thailand or Indonesia or whatever for like 50 quid. So, you know, that was, that was great. I, I loved that. And, um, in terms of like frustrations, I think everybody has frustrations in their working life, I guess. But I mean, for me, probably it was good for me to work in a firm because it made me really sure that that's what I didn't want to do. Um, and then I was able to get a job in house, and I do like I I quite like it. You know, it's not. I think I've been quite lucky in terms of the experience that I've had and, and the variety of work I've been able to do. And I hope that I can, you know, hold on to this job long enough to see us through the other end of this global pandemic or phase two. Or yeah, what, like a poster. Yeah. <laughs> so when you were working in Singapore, was that more of a lobbying position or were you working in like a UK firm and just making sure they were compliant with laws at home or how does that work? Well, that. That is an interesting question, actually, Simon. Yes. Um, so when you're working in my kind of role, it you know, obviously dealing with loads of different countries, and it's almost just an argument to be had about which laws apply to what. So if I'm doing a commercial contract, for example, I I'd obviously feel more comfortable if it's going to be governed by the laws of England and Wales because that's the law in which I'm technically qualified. But quite often we'll sign something else off and you know you've got no idea what it means there <laughs> because you're not qualified in that jurisdiction um but it's quite common to just accept different laws would govern a commercial contract for example but in my time in Singapore I was working for the company again another travel company um but I was just doing the same job that I was doing really in the UK um because I said the nature of our that sort of role you're dealing with different countries all the time and you just have an argument about what law might apply um but you, obviously you have to if you're operating in different jurisdictions you have to make sure that the company that you're advising is compliant with different rules and regulations in that jurisdiction so there's a certain amount of having to find out about what's required you know in terms of licenses or mm-hmm. or you know consumer law in terms of how, how protected should consumers be what you know in terms of prices that you might be showing to people or credit card charges or you know and you have to and it's impossible to be compliant everywhere with everything but you've got to try and be as compliant as possible and you know privacy is now a massive thing um I mean it has been for some time but obviously since the GDPR came in that's a huge concern you know you've got to make sure that you're you know those fines are massive if you get something wrong with Mm. in terms of personal data or there's a breach Um, and that can be absolutely crippling to a company if you're talking about whatever it is four percent of turnover or yeah it's food yeah yeah four percent of global turnover or like 11 billion or whichever, whichever's more, uh, yeah, but that's if that's well. if you get prosecuted, isn't it? Right. So um, it, it doesn't seem yeah, to uh, like it seems there's been things. a lot of lapses of that recently, and I don't know whether any prosecutions are happening or not. 
I think they, there are, and I think you've got to, there's obviously loads of reporting obligations if there's any breach, and it's just making sure things like that happen. Like recently we had, we had an issue with, you know, making sure that when people had unsubscribed or wanted to, you know, the right to be forgotten, that we were deleting them within the right time frames because there seemed to be a bit of a delay. So that's yeah. something we've had to look at. So I think there's no way you can be compliant with everything, but there's a, quite a lot to think about when you're dealing in a global company. Um, and that, you know, the law is the law where where people are based, where consumers are based, and you've got to try and not break it. Mm. Yeah, which isn't particularly easy, as you say. But I suppose as well, you know, I, I mean... I, I definitely imagined when I was younger in terms of lawyers and stuff that it would be a matter of, you know, you would have to store all this information in your head. But like largely it's, it, it's the same with medicine. Like you do have to know a lot, but also they're really training you how to look things up. It's more about trying to find the information, isn't it? So Yeah, and uh, Google. Yeah. <laughs> So what I was going to go, what I was going to go to, uh, like how do you think there's a a long term future need? Like, do you think law is a viable kind of job role going into the future when you could essentially build an app that gives robot. you all the relevant all the relevant info, basically? Yeah, so I you, don't, yeah, I don't, I do actually, I don't know. I think there is a there's certainly a skill. I think that. I've developed it's not just about having the information it's also making a decision based on the information that you have and the circumstances that surround whatever situation you're dealing with so I think there is still for now a space for us lawyers but having said that I mean I think I'm I've met a lot of lawyers in my time who I think aren't particularly good at providing advice to companies they just know what the law is yeah. and I think it's a very different Thing, knowing what the law is and knowing what to do with that information and how to apply it to a scenario and so I think there's yeah I think there's a there's more to being a lawyer than knowing the law yeah it's interpretation as well yeah yeah so uh, yeah it, of, it, unlike risk risk assessment I guess as well you know there's uh, quite a lot of that that goes on yeah yeah so the, the, like kind of the calculation of of compliance like if you well, I suppose in like in the terms that you're talking, if you're working in multiple jurisdictions and you want to have an across the organisation sort of rule of like this is how we do things, it that's where it becomes that you, you know you have to make those calculations of well you can do that, but that puts you in maybe it puts you in not bang on safe territory. It puts you in sort of like more of a grey area that kind of thing, especially in a kind of commercial way because I think. A lot of lawyers, and I'm not one of them, but, you know, so pernickety about things and sort of anal that they lose sight of the bigger picture. And I think it's really important that you have an overview of something and you remember what, for example, you know, company objectives. And sometimes it's maybe better to take a calculated risk on something, even though, you know, it's not completely 100% watertight or maybe you know you're going to agree to some sort of liability under a contract because the the commercial benefits outweigh the risk that's it from me for this episode i hope you enjoyed it like share subscribe all the good stuff listen to the back episodes there will be a new episode in two weeks just a couple more to go before the end of the year and the end of volume one we will be back next year with volume two of course and that hopefully will be a much expanded offering so i'm hoping to get more more episodes out per week uh not not per week per month and just more episodes overall from the year obviously this year with the global gap year that we've all been in uh, has been quite difficult so yes that's it for me i'll see you in two weeks bye The Working Hours podcast is made by Western Studios Leeds.
If you're in Leeds and have a podcast idea that you would like to develop, then email makemypodcast at western-studios.com with some details about what you would like to achieve, and let's start making your podcast a reality today. Follow Western Studios on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram for news on new episodes of Working Hours, and also new original podcast productions which are coming soon from Western Studios Leeds. <laughs>